Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining the webinar. I'm Cynthia Benz, and I serve as Vice President of Public Policy at the Alliance for Aging Research and Executive Director of the Accelerate Cures and Treatments for Alzheimer's Disease Coalition, or as we call it, ACT-AD. On behalf of ACT-AD, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third in a series of biannual webinars focused on critical issues to the future of Alzheimer's disease research and development. Today's webinar, Clinical Meaningfulness in Alzheimer's Disease, will highlight the history of co-primary outcomes for measuring clinical meaningfulness in overt dementia, explore how thinking on co-primary endpoints is evolving as treatment moves earlier in the disease course, and examine if changes are necessary for future success in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. I'll be your moderator for today's program, but first I'd like to give you a bit of history on the ACT-AD Coalition and how we came up uh, with the topic for today's webinar. ACT-AD is a group of more than 50 national nonprofit organizations working with urgency to speed up the development of potential cures and more effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease. We do this by urging Food and Drug Administration officials and other policymakers to increase the attention and resources they devote to the challenges posed by Alzheimer's disease. Until the formation of ACT-AD in 2005, there was no single point of advocacy around the need for better treatments to combat Alzheimer's disease that combined the perspectives of respected advocates for research funding, women's health, aging services, and caregivers. We're strengthened by the diversity of the organizations that make up ACT-AD, and we're bringing that strength to bear on critical issues before the federal government concerning the development, review, and approval of a new generation of Alzheimer's disease treatments. FDD, FDA has taken a number of uh, actions in response to ACT-AD's advocacy. The agency established a Neurology Across FDA Interagency Working Group in 2005 that included representatives from FDA's Office of the Commissioner, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, and the Office of Health and Constituent Affairs. The working group regularly discussed how different centers and offices that have a hand in the review of neurology products can uh, pool expertise and collaborate more efficiently on the evaluation of promising new treatments for Alzheimer's and other neurological conditions. FTA has also extended their patient representative program to Alzheimer's patients and caregivers. This was the first step in giving a face and a voice to those with the disease into the drug review process. Previously, the patient representative program had only been utilized for HIV, AIDS, and cancer. And most importantly, FDA began working with the coalition on an annual workshop where representatives from the FDA could interact with leaders in the patient advocacy community, academia, and industry on issues that are current roadblocks or potential roadblocks to the successful review of new Alzheimer's disease products. ACT-ADs convene eight of these high-impact meetings on topics ranging from improving the efficiency of phase two trials, pursuing combination therapy development for Alzheimer's disease, assessing the scientific foundation for Alzheimer's disease drug development, and measuring clinical meaningfulness in AD. Clinical meaningfulness is not a new topic for us, but one that we thought warranted a webinar. It continues to hold a different meaning depending on who you ask, and it continues to be at the forefront of discussions as therapeutic development moves into intervention in the mild, prodromal, and asymptomatic population. We're fortunate to have some stellar experts joining us this morning who are gonna help us think through where we need to go next as a community. And now I'm just going to uh, take on a few housekeeping items. Um, each of our presenters are going to speak for about 15 minutes. The questions are going to be reserved for a Q&A period at the end of the program. So as you think of questions, you can feel free to either use the WebEx Q&A function or email me at cbenz at agingresearch.org, and I can add them to the Q&A queue. And then I'm going to ask as many of the questions as we can um, in the time remaining at the end of the program. We are recording today's program and the recording and all of the presentations that get approved uh, for posting will be available um, one to two weeks after the webinar on our website, which is www.act-ad.org. And I'm already predicting that the webinar is gonna be a success, so I'd like to thank um, all of my colleagues for their help in planning the program, and that's Sue Peshin, Sarah DeJovene, Ryan Carney, Noel Lloyd, and Brianna Bishop. And last but not least, I'd like to um, recognize ACT-AD sponsors, Alchemies, Anavex, Avenir, Biogen, Genentech, Eli Lilly and Company, Janssen, Lundbeck, Merck, and Novartis. Without your generosity, programs like the one today would not be possible. So thank you so much for your commitment. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Christina Sampaio. Dr. Sampaio is Chief Clinical Officer of the CHDI Foundation, 
Dr. Sampaio is also Professor of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics and a senior member of Movement Disorders Clinic in the Department of Neurology and is the principal investigator at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Until very recently, she was a member of both the Committee of Proprietary Medicinal, Medicinal Products and the Scientific Advice Working Party at the European Medicines Agency that provides guidance on the quality and non-clinical clinical safety and efficacy regarding new medicinal products, including those for orphan diseases like Huntington's disease. Dr. Sampaio's main research interests are the design and methodology of clinical studies in neurodegenerative disorders, pharmacoepidemiology, and evidence-based medicine. She joined CHDI in 2011. We're very fortunate to have her join us today to provide a European perspective on clinical meaningfulness in Alzheimer's disease. And Dr. Sampaio, I'm going to pull up your slides and you can take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so um, I was tasked to speak to you about um, the idea and the, of clinical meaningfulness and how the concept of um, coming with the um, primary endpoint come about in uh, in Europe, and um, to do so, I, I put together a timeline that I I'm sure most of you are aware uh, about uh, how the different drugs for uh, AD uh, were um, approved, and as you can see, Tacrine was the very first that is now a historic landmark, and it was approved in '93. And uh, this was before EMEA was even founded. And I think you need to be aware of these uh, timelines to understand the, the role of um, guidelines and guidance in the European space. Because Europe is a very heterogeneous space, as you are well aware, particularly in current political background. And um, EMEA is relatively recent. It's not as FDA that is standing there for a more, almost a century. So the EMEA was founded in 95. And the compulsory uh, assessment of uh, drugs for neurodegenerative disorders only, only came about in 2004. In fact, after the last drug, memantine, has been approved. So, uh, in, um, in this uh, time space, um, drugs could, could be approved either centrally or by the national countries. So, this was a space where there was a, a, a heterogeneity in the decisions made, where uh, not everybody was fully aligned in the, in the way of making those decisions. And so it was a, a time of a relatively heterogeneity. In any case, the concept that uh, we would need to have drugs that would represent a benefit for the patient were always in the in the mind of the regulators and the, in the in the in the concept of the decisions that were made. And you should remember that in Europe again, differently from what happened in the U.S., most of the countries had a large number of drugs approved for age-related indications that were ill-defined and that uh, people didn't know exactly what they were. So these were, uh, you know, uh, um, aging-related memory disorders, uh, uh, aging neurodegenerative uh, um, yeah. Uh, aging by itself, so very uh, undefined kind of indications. And the European market at the time, in the 90s, were struggling with the number of drugs approved for those uh, indications in different countries, different, in, different uh, um, labels, completely heterogeneous situations. So EMEA came uh, to um, to be alive in this uh, space, uh, which there was need to uh, organize think, uh, things. So one of the discussions was how to demonstrate clinical meaningfulness, how to de demonstrate clinical uh, relevance. And 
the very first guidance that was start to be drafted in 95 uh, already mentioned uh, and the text of this guidance was already very clear in terms of uh, 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 giving um, importance to the uh, so-called uh, uh, co-primary endpoints. Uh, it was already saying that it was extremely important to have an evaluation in three domains, not just two, in three domains, the cognition, the functional endpoint, and the global endpoint. And this is going to happen across the time uh, ac across the, the, the decades, let's say, um, but in this very first draft that became a guideline uh, shortly after uh, EMEA was, um, at the time it was called EMEA, but uh, it dropped the second E along the years as well, um, EMEA at that time uh, uh, already mentioned it was very important to prove that, uh, that uh, a drug would have uh, a relevance for the, the patient, that it would prove an effect not only in cognition, because the, 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 the problem there was nobody knew what the cognitive scales were measuring and how large an effect in the cognitive scale um, it would be, uh, uh, what, what an effect size in the cognitive scale would be sufficient to impact on the everyday life of the patients. That was the big question. And so the solution uh, was to have a second endpoint that would measure the impact on the everyday life. Of course, this would be controversial, wh whatever, what would be such a measure, but uh, the activities of daily living was a possibility. And in this early uh, guideline, um, the global endpoint was also considered. So we, in this early guideline, this was uh, 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 mentioned and the three uh, endpoints were lined up and the option of choosing between uh, these three two was given. Uh, but soon, uh, there was not so soon, it took almost 10 years. So this, this uh, guidance was revised. Uh, and um, in the following 10 years, in, 2000, in 2007, and you can see that this was after all uh, developments that have been um, uh, licensed uh, have already happened. So Mementin was licensed in 2002. So uh, all the, the development has already passed through the CHMP. All these uh, li uh, uh, development has alre already been, let's say, been benchmarked for the development of this uh, guidance. And this gui guidance has been, um, uh, it's a revision of the uh, 95 guidance. Um, it has been issued in 2007. Uh, again, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, um, write-up about the relevance of assessing three domains to have a proper evaluation of the relevance of the effect is mentioned, but now uh, it, it, there is a specific mention that the two primary endpoints should be cognition and the functional domain. And the, the global endpoint is uh, relegated to a key secondary endpoint. And you should bear in mind that in all uh, uh, previous, uh, all dossiers that existed before, the global endpoint has been actually the, the second co-primary endpoint. In never, or in none of those uh, uh, developments, uh, a functional endpoint was truly considered the second co-primary endpoint. So this guidance uh, really create a, a, a difference between what, uh, um, what actually uh, is, um, uh, um, what actually um, has happened in the previous uh, 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 developments and what the guidance is now recommended. 
Another thing that is very important uh, in the space, in the European space, and that has been given a lot of importance, and in fact this was critical in the uh, uh, assessment of the Mementin dossier, which made an important difference towards the approval at that time, was uh, is the responder analysis. So this is something that um, is very uh, particular for the uh, assessment in Europe space, which is the opportunity to measure how many patients uh, have what is called a relevant uh, effect. And this should be defined a priori in the, in the, in the protocol, what is a meaningful response and the patient's the, that do have that meaningful uh, response should be, the proportion of patients that have this meaningful response should be measured, and uh, uh, we should have a large proportion of such patients in the treated arms. So this go hand in hand with the idea of the co-primary endpoints, and is, a, let's say, a convergent kind of measure towards measuring meaningfulness. In any case, we should uh, um, be aware that there's been a lot of commentaries and a lot of dissension regarding the idea of the co-primary endpoints. Uh, um, uh, mostly uh, the, large, the, the biggest argument comes from the fact that this burdens the, effect, the, the sample size of the trial. So obviously, to have two co-primary endpoints uh, increases the need of um, of the sample. The sample becomes bigger, and this is the type of uh, uh, tables that uh, appear showing that uh, um, uh, the likelihood of uh, showing an effect in two co-primary endpoints uh, depends on the correlation of the, this, uh, these co-primary endpoints. And obviously, if the two uh, co-primary endpoints are um, perfectly correlated, uh, the burden would be not too high, but uh, in fact it would be uh, almost nil, but um, uh, that would not be a big advantage to have those two co-primary endpoints because they would be redundant. So we, we are aiming to uh, have co-primary endpoints that do not have a perfect correlation and therefore they will increase the sample size. So um, that is a price to pay. In Alzheimer's disease, um, it's a relatively prevalent disease, as all everybody knows, it's a high prevalent disease. So um, I would say f uh, having larger trials is not the biggest concern, particularly when we are looking for symptomatic treatments, and that's what have happened in the past. So um, the 2016 uh, guidance in Europe, which is currently a draft that is expected to be completed this month. Um, the, the, it go, the, this draft goes in line with the most, the current uh, um, guidance that has been published by FDA as well. It divides the recommendations from what is established for um, Alzheimer's disease dementia, dementia, and it separates it from what uh, will be early dementia, uh, early, uh, early Alzheimer's uh, disease without dementia. So for the, the stage with dementia, we are still exactly on the same recommendations. Still the two primary endpoints and favoring clearly cognitive and a functional domain. For the early stages, uh, the draft now recognizes that it's very difficult in these early stages to have sufficient tools with sufficient sensitivity that, um, uh, and that two co-primary endpoints will likely be difficult to, to achieve in these populations. So uh, it offers a number of uh, alternative solutions, including a possibility of a composite scale it does not mention specifically which composite scale, which in the FDA guidance it is mentioned, but here it is none it is mentioned, but the, um, the possibility of one is, is uh, uh, mentioned. So, uh, 
I would say that there is this permanent tension between applicants, as we call them in, in Europe, or sponsors, as they are called in US, and regulators regarding this two co the idea of the two co-primary endpoints that has been, let's say, the solution to tackle this uh, uh, problem of uh, clinical meaningfulness. Um, I also say that this approach has served the purpose for symptomatic treatments in the um, uh, stage of dementia. None of the developments have been stalled because of this approach. I would say that since 2002, at least in Europe, no other uh, development has been filed. There has been no rejections. And as you all know, none of the current trials have failed because one endpoint has been missed and not the other. The trials have just failed. So I would say that the issue of the co-primary endpoints is not an issue uh, in this basis. So I would say also that uh, uh, it's, it's a problem indeed, and the guidance I have recognized that indeed for the early stages, co-primary endpoints are not a solution. And so I, I would say that we need uh, to uh, find the best approach for the early stages. Um, otherwise, I, I would say that um, uh, it's probably a too much debated topic, but um, probably we don't have a, such a big problem in the stage of dementia and symptomatic treatments. And with this, I stop and I thank you for the attention very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sampaio, for your um, very insightful presentation. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Rusty Katz, um, who will give us our next presentation. Um, many of you know Rusty from his time um, at the Food and Drug Administration. Um, he is currently serving on ACT-AD's um, Science Advisory Board, as well as uh, being a very active participant in, um, in discussions around um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, during his 30 plus career, year career at the Food and Drug Administration, um, Dr. Katz was a major influence on uh, both research and the regulation of investigational treatments. Um, he's responsible for the approval of many um, new investigational therapies for neurologic diseases. He's written and lectured extensively on drug development and regulatory approval of drugs and biologics. And as I said, even in retirement, he continues to be active in the Alzheimer's space and keeps a watchful eye on what all of us are doing. Um, Dr. Katz received his uh, medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 1977. Uh, following residencies in neurosurgery and neurology, he began his career with the FDA as a medical officer in its division of neuropharmacological drug products in 1983. And this division reviews and approves um, drugs and biologics for neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. In 1999, he was appointed director of the division, and in 2005, he became the director of the Division of Neurology Products. In 2013, he was the recipient of the Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan uh, Research Award from the Alzheimer's Association for his contributions to leading the way in promising and innovative approaches to Alzheimer's disease treatment, prevention, and care. Um, even though he is retired uh, from the FDA, um, Rusty's views on um, all things uh, related to Alzheimer's disease uh, clinical trials continue to be a very important uh, part of what we do here at ACT-AD um, and what many of you are doing, uh, both in the public and private sector, so we're really fortunate um, to have him here today. And so, Rusty, I'm going to pass the presenter controls to you right now, and uh, when you're ready, you can take it away. Uh, okay, thanks very much, uh, Cynthia, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was asked to give uh, a historical perspective uh, of how the agency has uh, thought about um, clinical meaningfulness in the context of Alzheimer's disease, and, and I think a fair amount of what I'm going to say uh, mirrors what uh, I think you've just heard Christina say. There are differences. Uh, but uh, but I think there's considerable overlap. But I, I think it's uh, useful to uh, to see where we've been and and how we got to where we are. And of course, uh, uh, no longer being at the FDA, I can't speak to what the future uh, will be like. Uh, 
but uh, I was there for some of the uh, events at the beginning, uh, and uh, so I think it might be useful to hear um, how we got where we are. So uh, I actually want to start with um, something that has had nothing to do specifically with the development of treatments for Alzheimer's disease, but was a um, a very important uh, court case which which uh, spoke to the question of clinical meaningfulness uh, writ large, not necessarily specifically for Alzheimer's disease, but this, it did actually come at, at, at an opportune time for uh, the, um, events that were going on in the Alzheimer's realm. Anyway, um, I won't go into great detail about this case, but it's, it's known as uh, Warner Lambert uh, v. Heckler, and it, it was uh, written in 1986. Uh, Margaret Heckler was the secretary, I think at the time it was Health Education and Welfare before it became uh, Health and Human Services. But in any event, this was a, a ruling by the U a U.S. Court of Appeals at the, at the Third Circuit, which I, I think is based out of Philadelphia. Anyway, uh, this had to do with a, a case where the FDA uh, withdrew approval for a bunch of uh, uh, drugs, oral proteolytic enzymes, that we use to treat a variety of uh, tissue injury states and other indications. Th these drugs were put on the market before 1962 when the law, uh, uh, it was only 1962 when the law was changed to require evidence of effectiveness for drugs to be approved. And so uh, after 1962, the agency asked for information about effectiveness from all the drugs that were approved prior to 1962. And when the evidence came in for these drugs, uh, they were taken off the market uh, for various reasons, a complicated case. But um, uh, one of the reasons was because uh, the agency didn't think they had any clinical benefit. And uh, uh, a number of sponsors sued the agency in this case was the result. Anyway, the, the court uh, made it very clear that uh, the concept of clinical meaningfulness was uh, uh, an appropriate concept for the FDA uh, to apply, and the FDA had the authority to apply that, con uh, that construct. And, and so I just picked out a few quotes, which I think sort of speak directly to <clears throat> this question. So... Uh, the court said that the fact that the drug and not chance can be assumed to have contributed to the fact the measure does not necessarily establish that the patients will receive a benefit from the drug. So, uh, and, and in one line with that, it said it would be anomalous to hold that drug manufacturers may demonstrate effectiveness merely by showing statistical significance. And one of the arguments the sponsors made was, look, we, we, we measured something, it, was that it reached statistical significance, and that should be uh, good enough. And the court said, no. Uh, the agency has the authority to uh, to say that a drug must actually have some benefit for the patient and not just showing statistical significance. Re remember that the, the law that the agency works under, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, says uh, that sponsors have to submit uh, substantial evidence that the drug has the effect claimed for it in labeling. So the sponsors said, well, look, we did something. We moved some scale, however small, it reached statistical significance. And since the law says... Um, there has to be substantial evidence that the drug has the effect claimed for in labeling. We can claim this change in labeling. We can describe this in labeling. And therefore, we should be allowed to do it. And the court said, no, the agency can determine that it has to actually have a benefit for patients. So very, very small changes that reach statistical significance on particular outcome measures need not necessarily require that that drug be approved. It actually has to benefit the patient in some way. And this was a an important case, uh, and but although the court did say that this uh, finding is consistent with FDA policy and practice, and that's true. That That's true that uh, we, uh, I was at the agency since 1983, so I was there before this ruling, and um, it certainly was the case that we uh, felt that the drug had to have show some effect on a, on a patient, some beneficial effect on a patient, not just to uh, change some scale, the meaning of which we didn't know. Uh, and again, I think this is a concept that Christine has described. So in any event, uh, the the next step, uh, uh, because Alzheimer's research was uh, was taking off at this time, the next step was for the agency to uh, articulate principles for the development of treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And 
So we convened a meeting, I believe it was a two-day meeting of uh, our advisory committee with additional experts added and uh, to talk about what ought to be the standards in the United States for approving a drug for Alzheimer's disease. And we had this meeting, we uh, called it Anti-Dementia Drug Assessment Symposium and many of the issues related to developing treatments for Alzheimer's disease were discussed uh, at that meeting, including um, uh, outcome measures. Uh, and as a result of this meeting, a guideline was uh, was written. It's called the Guidelines for the Clinical Evaluation of Anti-Dementia Drugs. It was a first draft. It was uh, made public in uh, November of 1990. It was uh, written by Paul Lieber, who was the, 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 the director of the division at the time. And I do urge all of you who are interested in this to actually uh, find that on the web and look at it. It's an extraordinarily articulate and comprehensive document that talks not just about developing treatments for Alzheimer's disease, but developing drugs in general. It's, it's worth taking a look at. It covers uh, all areas related to Alzheimer's dementia, but specifically uh, there is a section that talks about specific assessments required to document an anti-dementia claim. Now, early in the document, uh, it sort of takes as a given that uh, a drug to be approved for an, uh, an anti-dementia claim or an Alzheimer's claim uh, must have an effect on the core symptoms of, uh, of dementia, including memory, learning, that sort of thing. So it sort of takes that as a given, but when it, when it begins to talk specifically about outcome measures, uh, the first thing it mentions, mentions uh, a, a, a the four core manifestations is clinical meaningfulness. So it's, and it says to gain an anti-dementia indication, the sponsor must provide substantial evidence that the product uh, one has a clinically meaningful effect and exerts its effect on the core symptom. Uh, and um, this was a, uh, again, th th these principles arose out of this uh, meeting of experts in the previous year. Uh, and this, uh, so this co-primary approach, in other words, both of these have to be uh, uh, shown to be positive, uh, was endorsed by this uh, committee in this document. Uh, puts that down. Uh, uh, Christina talked about um, uh, responder uh, definition, and uh, that was never an issue here in the U.S. Um, there, it was there was just an, an expectation that an anti-dementia drug would have to show basically a, a mean effect on um, a measure of clinical meaningfulness uh, and a mean effect on some measure of the core manifestations of dementia. So responded definition was never uh, never uh, a real concern here. So just to, to go on uh, a little bit more about what the guidelines talk about, um, uh, this concept of uh, showing the effect on, on um, clinical meaningfulness as well as on the core symptoms, it goes on to say explicitly that uh, this requirement can be met by showing that the drug has an effect on, on uh, both a global assessment performed by a skilled clinician and a performance-based objective test instrument providing comprehensive assessment of cognitive function. So that's the the uh, clinical meaningfulness and the um, that's how one could show clinical meaningfulness as well as the effect on the core symptom. And uh, the guidelines go into some detail about the types of global assessments that were available at the time. It names some, but it certainly didn't uh, endorse any. Uh, and uh, it says that there are two types of global assessments. There are improvement ratings and severity assessments. And um, here I think is an important point. The document talks about the nature of uh, uh, global assessments. And uh, it, it goes to pains, it goes, uh, to, pains to say that the facets of uh, patient behavior and appearance considered by a clinician formulating a global assessment are not ordinarily specified. Nothing prevents a rater from focusing on different attributes or assigning different ways to attributes on different occasions. So the document says that the uh, global assessment should be done by a clinician skilled uh, and experienced in evaluating patients with dementia. And that person can more or less take anything into consideration uh, when deciding how to uh, rate a patient's overall global uh, uh, functioning. Uh, and they can take different things into account at different times during the study. So we actually use the word, at least internally, um, 
that uh, the rating was uh, considered to be or supposed to be holistic. It's not a word that we use very often in, in um, reference to drug development or an outcome measure. But the idea here really was that a skilled, experienced clinician was uh, supposed to rate the patient, bringing to bear uh, anything he or she felt was relevant uh, to that assessment. Really no um, specific benchmarks or milestones or specific tests to be done. And although the document actually is, is, is not uh, explicit on this point, I think there really was uh, an understanding uh, that the global rating was not just supposed to recapitulate the cognitive measure, which was the other co-primary required. It really was supposed to look at a different domain, and it, it was, in, to some extent, to, designed to look at all domains of functioning, uh, and, and not just to uh, reassess the patient's specific cognitive function. Uh, the whole idea here was to, to, to measure effects of the drug on two different domains, functioning or general overall, um, uh, well, let's say functioning, as well as specific uh, effects on the core symptoms. So the document... Um, uh, is, let me move the slide, the document is uh, clear that um, there are differences and it talks uh, uh, to some degree about the differences between the uh, uh, severity scales as opposed to improvement scales. Uh, it does suggest that uh, severity scales might be expected to have greater inter-rater reliability. It, it talks about how people can be trained to make these sorts of ratings. Improvement scales uh, tend to be uh, tend to be less reliable, but they may be more sensitive to small clinical effects. The, the, the document does not endorse any uh, type, any particular scale, certainly, or any of the types of scales that it talks about. I, I want to make a, a point here about um, uh, the sensitivity to small clinical effects that it specifically talks about in the context of improvement scales. Uh, and again, Christina talked about a responder uh, criterion. And of course, no, but the re responder criterion, as I say, that was never really an issue for us. The responder criterion, as she described, requires that a particular threshold uh, be uh, prospectively designated as being an important change, and um, and therefore you can you can sort of uh, decide whether or not patient meets that threshold, and this is called a responder. Uh, it was very clear to us that that was something we were not actually particularly interested in. We, we of course, wanted the measure of clinical meaningfulness or this global assessment because, as Christina pointed out, we, we didn't have any idea what the clinical meaning, what, what, what a, a small change on a sensitive cognitive measure might mean to the patient, to the patient's functioning, the patient's uh, um, life. Uh, that's why the global measure was introduced. But there was no specific expectation that a certain particular amount of change was necessary on the global assessment. If there was any change on the global assessment that turned out to be statistically significant in the face of any change on the uh, cognitive measure, we felt that was sufficient to conclude that uh, this that drug helped people uh, and had a clinical clinically meaningful benefits. So it didn't have to be a particular size of change. The global measure was there to ensure that the effect on the cognitive measure meant something clinically to the patient, and it didn't have to be a big change, and we didn't want to set a threshold as to how big that change should be on the global assessment. Any improvement or benefit on functioning we thought was a good thing. Uh, and so it talks about uh, the limitations uh, and the problems with each of these types of global scales, but then it goes on to say that despite these limitations, global assessments are the ultimate test of the clinical utility of a drug's anti-dementia effect, and therefore any drug that uh, wanted a claim had to be able to show an effect on some sort of measure of global assessment. Um, so... I'm trying to get these slides to move. Okay, so anyways, the document states the original idea was for the global to be rated by a skilled clinician. It actually is fairly explicit. It says that it, it has to be rate, uh, has to be based on the, the clinician's rating. Uh, 
and not reports from others, caregivers or uh, other folks who might have had contact with the patient. It really was supposed to be, in some sense, a pure uh, uh, assessment by the a skilled clinician. But there, were, uh, there was a lot of pushback from uh, members of many relevant communities about this concept. And um, they made clear that uh, that was highly unrealistic and, and maybe not even really relevant or possible, and that when clinicians assess patients just in the course of normal practice, there was always somebody there who could report uh, how the patient was doing um, other than the patient. So it was a, a spouse or some sort of a caregiver or someone who knew how the patient was doing. So that led uh, the division to conclude that that concept of pure clinician rating had to be amended. And this has led to uh, numerous uh, types of scales that are that do take into consideration uh, caregiver input. And maybe the most common one, or certainly the one most commonly used uh, for drug development to date anyway, is this so-called Civic Plus, which stands for the clinician in, uh, interview plus the input from a caregiver. And that's become fairly standard. And uh, other types of globals that have been used uh, also take into consideration uh, caregiver uh, input. And so that is a, that's now a standard uh, part of uh, these assessments. Uh, again, there was never a, a, a requirement for any specific global rating, either a specific scale or a specific one of the types of scales that the document talked about. Um, a number of scales have been used that are sort of less holistic, that look at actual activities of daily living and functional scales, uh, but the agency has always considered those perfectly reasonable as well. They do look at function, and that's the real idea here. Um, so the the as, uh, as throughout the uh, development of the drugs that are all have been approved, uh, this principle has continued to be applied. It has uh, treatment has to show benefit to the patient, and that means not just a, a change on a sensitive specific cognitive measure. In fact, really has to have um, an effect on the patient's functioning. And, and here's sort of the, uh, which leads, in, the principle that sort of leads into the, the current, I think, environment is that if there is a discernible decrement in the patient's functioning, uh, however slight, uh, we always took the position that the treatment has to be shown to have an effect on that functioning. Uh, and so that sort of takes us up to... Uh, uh, I, I don't seem to be able to move to the next slide. I don't know, Cynthia, if you can move to the slide. It's not... I just moved to nine. Yeah, to nine. Yeah, that's my you're last there. slide. I mean, hmm? Okay, you're there. It's on nine. Uh, well, okay, I can't see it. But anyway, all right, so uh, th this principle... Uh, about if there is a, this, uh, a discernible uh, fun decrement in functioning, the drug has to have an effect on functioning, uh, continues to be applied in the current uh, draft uh, of developing treatments for early stage disease, which was uh, uh, first came out in 2013, in which the agency, uh, here it is, thanks, uh, in which the agency uh, talks about developing treatments for patients uh, much earlier in the course of the disease, which, of course, is what's happening now, um, and prodromal AD, so-called, or MCI due to AD. But the document says that these patients are considered to have relatively mild but noticeable impairments in their daily functioning, and it's therefore important to demonstrate that the drug favorably affects these deficits. And um, as Christina points out, this document offers the use of a composite scale uh, as opposed to separate so-called co-primaries, which has been the, uh, the standard so far in patients with uh, frank dementia. But the composite scale still has to assess both cognition and function. And so uh, I'll end there, uh, but I hope you have a sense of how we got to where we are now in that document. Of course, not 
obviously I'm not at the agency anymore. I don't know what the final version of that document is going to look like. But at least in the initial version, the principle that if the patient is having difficulty in functioning, a treatment has to have an effect on that functioning has been embodied at least in the in the first draft. And it's a principle that has uh, been in place since uh, the early 90s. Uh, so I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Rusty. That was a really um, informative presentation and I think gives us a lot of uh, basis for, for some of the questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to introduce our, um, our final speaker, uh, Dr. Yakov Stern. Uh, Dr. Stern is the Professor of Neuropsychology at the Tau Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Stern directs the Cognitive Neuroscience Division of the Department of Neurology and the Postdoctoral Training Program in Neuropsychology and Cognition and Aging. Dr. Stern received his BA in Psychology from Turo College in 1975. He received his doctoral training in the Experimental Cognition Program at the City University of New York, where he received his PhD in 1983. Dr. Stern began his association with Columbia University Medical Center in 1979 when he began work on, the dissert on his dissertation research on cognition and Parkinson's disease. After receiving his PhD, he was appointed postdoctoral research scientist in 1983 and eventually professor in 1996. To date, Dr. Stern supervised 20 postdoctoral fellows. He served on the editorial board of Journals of Neuropsychology and Aging Neuropsychology and Cognition, and as associate editor of the Journal of the International Neuropsychological Association. He's currently on the editorial board of the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Neuropsychology and the Journal of the International Neuropsychological Society. Dr. Stern's presentation is going to cover patterns of cognitive and functional decline in Alzheimer's disease, and I think um, tie everything together nicely. So, um, Dr. Stern, I am passing the presenter controls to you now, and you can take it away. Thank you very much. I'm trying to see if I can get the, um, here we go, the pointer. Okay, uh, thanks so much, uh, um, Cynthia, for that introduction. Um, so the last two talks um, have covered the regulatory um, concepts um, that drove um, the way that drug studies are designed today. Uh, so most drug studies designed today have a cognitive endpoint and a functional endpoint, and the uh, functional endpoint is there to demonstrate clinical, meaning, clinical, clinical meaningfulness. Uh, and my talk is more of a research-based talk where we've tried to study the interaction between cognition and function in Alzheimer's disease and in, in normal aging as well. Um, cognition and function uh, in Alzheimer's disease, if you have two measures, they always correlate with one another, uh, but that correlation is not perfect, so you can have people who have more functional problems than cognitive problems and vice versa, so they really do measure different things. Um, Here's some disclosures, um, I guess support from some drug companies for um, consulting. Um, so this is sort of a complex looking slide, but let me just show you what's going on here. We have two key measures, a measure, the, the, this is the blessed dementia rating scale, which is a very old measure of, of function. It measures basic activities of daily living, like uh, eating, dressing, and toileting, plus instrumental activities of daily living, like uh, orienting or making change. And here's the mini mental, which is a measure of cognition. And you can see that we, in, in the, the, the study that we have here, we have 517 Alzheimer's patients that were followed every six months for many, many years. Uh, and you can see the analyst here lines up. Let's, here's the, the functional scale. The score is across all, all of these visits and then can summarize them into where they start and how they change over time. And similarly, we can take the cognitive measure, the mini mental, and uh, summarize it for each person into where they start and where they change over time. And then all these arrows here are supposed to look at that. We can look at the relationship between change in function and change in cognition. And here we can also look at psychiatric symptoms. So the, the key thing that we found here is that cognitive and functional changes were coupled within individuals. It seems reasonable, but no, no one had ever formally showed this before. So as people change cognitively, they also change functionally. And worse initial cognitive status predicted subsequent functional decline and vice versa. So those who are worse on cognition um, 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 decline more rapidly on function and vice versa. Uh, 
So all this slide show is, is, is intended to show you is how we can look at these data of, of function and cognition and look how they change over time and how the change in one is related to the change in the other. The key analysis that we did, I think, is this one. So now we can ask a more complicated question. We, look at, we can look at cognition at time one, time two, time three, time four, and function uh, uh, over time. And now we can ask not just are they related to one another, but does one lead the other? So let's say cognition at time one always predicts function at time two, and cognition at time two always predicts function at time three. What this would suggest is that the cognition is changing first and is sort of causing the functional change. This is called a lag model. Um, so uh, we actually did this analysis in, in three different data sets. One is a very large data set of people in the North Manhattan community, both demented and non-demented, over 3,000 people, which were followed about every 18 months. Uh, in that same population, we only looked at people who had uh, with incident dementia, that is from the time that they developed the dementia and going forward. And then we also looked at them in this predictor study, which is the data set that I showed you before, which was a, is a longitudinal study of people with mild Alzheimer's disease. And what we were really asking in each of these three data sets is, what comes first, cognitive or functional change? Uh, and let me just summarize what we found. So over all of those three data sets, the cognitive score more consistently predicted subsequent function than vice versa, both in non-demented older adults and in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So in non-demented older adults, we had um, neuropsychological tests of memory and language, and they reliably predicted self-reported functional ability at every subsequent visit, so that if you looked at one visit, they predicted function at the next visit, whereas self-reported function predicted cognitive scores only two-thirds of the time. It was more dramatic amongst people with Alzheimer's disease, where functional ability only predicted subsequent cognition at three out of 11 visits, where at uh, cognition predicted function at every subsequent visit. Um, so basically what we're, we, we draw from these um, results is that somehow the cognitive change uh, um, that occurs somehow is responsible for the subsequent functional change. Now again, I don't think people are surprised surprised by that, you would assume that somehow the disease is affecting basic cognitive functions, Alzheimer's disease, such as memory and, and language and other intellectual abilities. And because people have the decrements in this cognition, um, they, they end up having problems doing things day to day, the, the clinical uh, meaningfulness of, the, of those um, cognitive problems is that they eventually have problems doing things from day to day. Um, the reason that this, I think, has taken on some importance is the problem is that once we get to clinical trials, not in prevalent Alzheimer's disease, but let's say in mild cognitive impairment, people with a milder problem, um, the changes in function are very, very hard to measure. And I think that's a lot of what's driving um, the discussion today. These changes in function are harder to measure. So uh, some people would like to take these findings that I've shown, and they've been replicated elsewhere, to say, well, maybe um, even though uh, we don't have a finding on a functional endpoint, the fact that we show that a drug affects a clinical endpoint can be uh, taken to assume that it really is clinically meaningful since cognition drives function. Uh, you know, and that part of the difficulty there is that the, um, both the cognitive measures and the functional measures that are used uh, really become less sensitive when you get to early and earlier conditions. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. Um, um, here's the, uh, um, a summary of what's called instrumental activities of daily living. Um, so not eating, dressing, and toileting, but more advanced kinds of activities like ability to use a phone, shopping, food preparation, housekeeping, uh, modes of transportation. These are um, meaningful measures of day-to-day -day functioning, um, and usually many of these instrumental activities of daily living are incorporated into the functional scales that are used um, in studies of uh, Alzheimer's disease medications. Um, the problem is that um, these uh, um, IDLs are really not that sensitive once you get to very mild uh, dementia, mild dementia, or once you get to cognitively normal people that might have preclinical dementia. Um, 
really they're uh, endorsed only maybe 20% of the time in, in healthy elderly people. So just as an exercise, we said, well, what if we can make a more sensitive measure of instrumental activities of daily living? So based on a, a, a large set of community-dwelling elders, non-demented, we tried to create an extended scale where we now incorporated some day-to-day -day leisure activities along with these instrumental activities of daily living. Um, and here's the scale that we made. Um, um, on the bottom are some of the classic instrumental activities of daily living, help with medication, trouble around the neighborhood, shopping, chores. Uh, and then these up here are uh, leisure activities that people report uh, doing. Uh, and although this looks like a simple scale, it meets a lot of very complex psychometric um, requirements. Uh, I think this is sort of the, the, the key uh, finding, is that in 70-year-old um, healthy community dwelling elders, um, almost this is standard instrumental activities, almost everybody could do all of those nine items. Very few people could do less than nine items. So here's everyone who could do nine, eight, seven. Everyone could do those. Now, with this extended scale, though, we really got a distribution such that even in healthy elderly people, um, only about half of the people could do all the items. And we really had, I mean, I'm sorry, a very few, a few people could do all the items. And, and the great majority of people could only do about half of the items. So it's a much more sensitive measure of function. Uh, than the standard instrumental activities of daily living. And also, we were able to show that people, uh, cognitively normal people, who were worse on the scale, were more likely to develop dementia on follow-up. So, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble now moving this to. Let's see if I can do it. Okay, so maybe, uh, Cynthia, maybe, you, oh, perfect. So, the, my point is that the, I think I do agree that the standard functional scales that are used in Alzheimer's disease, disease trials are relatively insensitive when the disease uh, that we're, when the condition that we're studying is mild. So for in MCI, you can see mild cognitive impairment, you can see some problems in, um, in these instrumental activities of daily living, but these scales are no longer sensitive. As trials move even earlier to people who are sort of at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, the, um, these functional measures are going to be less sensitive. So I think this has sparked the move uh, or a call from uh, investigators to say, well, can't we just rely on the cognitive measures since these cognitive measures appear to be more sensitive and anyway, cognition is responsible for change in function. Um, so, you know, the conclusions that you can draw from the data that I presented is cognition and function decline in tandem in both aging and dementia, and using our current measures, changes in cognition lead changes those in, changes uh, in function, um, and that subtle changes in function are difficult to assess in healthy elders or mildly impaired individuals. But I, I think one thing to think about is that maybe new, more uh, sensitive functional scales are, are feasible and need to be developed. Uh, and I think the other thing that we have to think about is even the standard cognitive measures that have been used in trials really are not sufficiently sensitive as we move to earlier conditions. So the 8S COG, which is a, a standard cognitive measure used in trials, is really not that sensitive in mild cognitive impairment. And once you get to sort of these preclinical dementia stages, it's not sensitive at all. So I think really what has to be done from a research point of view is to optimize measures of cognition and function such that we can have sensitivity to uh, real-world changes. And again, we could try to meet this drive to say, okay, uh, you have a change in a cognitive measure that's clinically significant, but is it something that's really clinically meaningful to the uh, patient? Okay, thank you for your attention, and I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stern. Um, we do have um, one question that came in. It's a two-part question, um, and now all the speakers um, are off of mute. Um, and the question's for uh, Dr. Cass. Um, the question is that uh, the FDA's early AD guidance uh, from February of 2013 suggests that cognition alone could be used to grant accelerated approval in early AD. 
Um, do you get the sense that this still represents the division's current thinking? And we recognize that you are not at the division, so this will be your, your personal opinion. Um, and then the follow-up question is um, re regarding accelerated approval, uh, would the durability of the effect be sufficient for uh, post-marketing study, or might the bar be a bit higher? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm really loath to uh, state what the, uh, even what my view is of what the division's current thinking is. So I, I really, I'd rather stay away from that. Uh, I know obviously it's a, it's a, a hotly discussed topic there and elsewhere, but um, I, so, so I, I don't really want to uh, say what I think the division's current thinking is, I, I don't really know the division's current thinking. I, I will say um, that the uh, the idea that um, cognition alone could be uh, could serve as a uh, I'm hearing some sort of strange noises. Uh, the, the idea that cognition alone uh, could be uh, serve as the basis for approval under acceler under accelerated approval uh, mechanisms. I think was an indication that the agency recognizes that the outcome measures uh, have to be relevant for the population that's being studied. Uh, and that if a patient uh, does not have any discernible, at least by sort of current measures, decrement in functioning, they can't be, we, we can't expect the drug to show an effect on, on the functioning. Uh, there, there is no problem in functioning, at least as how we measure it now with, as Dr. Stern says, you know, some not terribly sensitive measures. But the idea is that if all you can tell is that the patient has a subtle cognitive deficit and no functional deficit, you can't require a drug to show an effect on, on function. So, uh, I, so I think that th this idea of an effect on cognition alone in early patients as a basis for accelerated approval is a recognition by the agency that uh, you, you can't do what you can't do, uh, which uh, leads to the second part of the question, I think, which is, the, the question is what, I, if I understand it, is that would the durability of effect on the cognitive measure in the post-marketing study be enough to, um, to uh, document that the drug has an effect that you want? I can only tell you what we were thinking at the time. I was there, obviously, when the, the draft was written. And I think the answer would be no, that it would not be enough. It, w it wouldn't be enough to say, well, there's in the post marketing study, well, we're still having an effect on uh, cognition. I think at least my view was, okay, we already know it has an effect on cognition from the uh, study that uh, served as the basis for approval in this scenario. Now you have to show that it actually has the effect we want, which is how any sort of surrogate is used. And then the effect we want is to show that it has an effect on the patient's functioning somehow. So that would be the requirement in the post-marketing study to show an effect on functioning. Now, again, uh, Dr. Cern has talked about developing uh, more sensitive scales for these patients. And as I said before, at least historically, we weren't terribly concerned about how big the effect on functioning was. If there was a real effect due to the drug on functioning that was measurable, that was at least historically good enough. So it wouldn't have to be a huge effect, and on a sensitive scale of uh, sensitive measure of functioning, if there was a, if there was movement, a statistically significant difference, uh, that at least in my mind, that would have been good enough in these patients. But no, I don't think just continuing to show an effect on cognition would be enough in the post marketing study. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Stern. Um, given that the National Institute on Aging has been um, appropriated some significant increases in funding for Alzheimer's research, um, what do you think some of the research gaps are in the types of measures um, that are needed moving forward? And um, in your view, should the National Institute on Aging consider focusing some of their funding um, on the, the helping to develop these types of measures? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question since I do that kind of research. Um, <laughs> give it all to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, um, I, I, I think that um, there is there is uh, some work going on uh, uh, on better better measures. I, I think this issue of what measures are really appropriate, both cognitive and functional, as we go earlier and earlier into the disease, are ongoing. Um, uh, 
um, you know, there's this big A4 study, uh, which is treating people who are um, um, amyloid positive that do have amyloid in their brain, but are cognitively normal. And so I think studies like that will give us a lot of, inf whether the, the drug works or not, will give us a lot of information about changes in cognition and changes in function. But I do feel that there could be a little bit more emphasis on developing better measures, both of cognition and function, uh, particularly measures that directly are related to the uh, underlying pathology can sort of be linked to it uh, and therefore might really help us um, with, with these trials. Terrific. Um, that is, um, unfortunately, all the time we have, and um, I'd really like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the speakers for uh, both their, their really insightful presentations, um, as well as taking the time to uh, run over a little bit to answer uh, some of your questions. Um, again, I'd like to thank um, ACT-AD sponsors, Alchemies, Anavex, Avenir, Biogen, Genentech, Eli Lilly, Janssen, Lundbeck, Merck, and Novartis. Um, and uh, again, we'll uh, have a recording of the webinar available um, in the next week or two um, for any of your colleagues to, um, to view as well. But thank you all for your time this morning, and I hope you all have a great day.